Hey, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Those who are joining us on WebEx, hello, and thank you for those joining us on YouTube. Uh, today we are going to be discussing shortness of breath. We're going to be talking about potential causes with a particular emphasis on COPD, as well as ways to manage. Uh, Winnie and her team put an incredible presentation together today. We're going to introduce her in just a few moments. In the meantime, I'm going to go over a few ground housekeeping rules just for those who are joining us on webinars, on this WebEx, um, you'll see on the bottom bar that there are a few different buttons. There is a button that looks like a microphone. Whenever it is off, it is going to um, be uh, red, indicates when you're muted, and when you're not muted and you want to speak up, you can just click on the button and we'll be able to hear you. If you want to turn on your video, you're more than welcome to click that button as well. And then we'll be able to see you as well. If you have any questions, we'll be able to see your face. Now, those who are joining us on YouTube, um, you will not be able to uh, speak up, but you are able to type any questions that you have. We have a live chat reply, which I'll be monitoring. So if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to uh, let, let us know and we'll be able to address them uh, at some point throughout the presentation. Now, um, for those who are uh, used to our YouTube page, we've made a few changes. So. We've made it a lot more organized for you to find all of the videos that we have available. We have currently 161 videos on our YouTube page, um, talking about anything from hypertension to medications and, of course, to uh, breathing. So if you just go on our YouTube page, you'll be able to see on the home screen all of the different video series we have. And we're constantly adding new videos all the time. You can see right here that these are some of the recent videos that we've done. Now I also wanted to direct your attention to something that we've implemented in our videos. These are called timestamps. So a lot of times our live webinars, which is the ones that we're doing right now, they can be quite long and sometimes you are looking for specific information. So what we've done is we have divided up the video into sections. So as soon as you click on the video, you'll see that the progress bar has been divided into different chunks and there you can click on whatever part of the video you're interested in watching. Uh, I also wanted to highlight some videos that we've done recently. Last week, Steffi and her team did a fantastic presentation with Chad, uh, who's a patient and a fellow friend of ours here at the clinic. Uh, we did a great presentation discussing soups, smoothies, all of the health benefits. Chad shared some delicious recipes. And we also discussed how you can eat healthy on a budget. And of course, we actually posted a video this morning on uh, hypertension. Um, so in this video, we're discussing, should I have a blood pressure machine? We discuss how to measure your blood pressure, the benefits of reducing your blood pressure. We talk about the DASH diet. And we, at the end of the video, we talk about the secret or the one thing that you can do to manage your hypertension uh, in the best possible way. So be sure to check out that video. I've also linked it in the description underneath this video. So you're more than welcome to check it out at any time. Uh, now, without further ado, um, Winnie is the, the lead here who put a, together a fantastic presentation with her team. I'm going to pass it over to her, who's going to be introducing what we'll be talking about today in this presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much for the intro, Stu. Uh, so, as you can see, we have quite a bit lined up for today. We are going to be discussing uh, specifically COPD, but also touching upon a lot of other causes of shortness of breath, uh, which I'm sure a couple of individuals who are joining us today may experience. Uh, we'll also be talking a bit about how assessment works as well as breathing techniques to help you cope with shortness of breath. And we're joined with a lovely guest speaker, Corinne Woodley, our local respiratory therapist who is a an amazing, amazing support. So she'll be talking to us a bit about that. Uh, and then next we'll be moving into uh, lifestyle changes that could potentially help you cope with shortness of breath, as well as puffers and medication, uh, and other supports and resources that are out there to help you. Alright, so moving on. So just a little bit about us. <laughs> um, I'm over there on the, uh, the right side. My name is Winnie. Nice to meet everyone. I'm a recent McMaster Health Sciences graduate, and evidently I uh, still enjoy going to the clinic so much that I'm continuing this past grad. <laughs> and I'm joined here today by our lovely team, uh, Jess and Ted, who um, feel free to give yourself a quick introduction right now. Introduce yourselves. Okay, perhaps. Well, should I go first? Oh yeah, go for it. Go for it. 
<laughs> right. Um, so hi guys. Um, my name's Ted. Um, I'm a second year uh, studying health sciences at McMaster, and it is also my first year uh, volunteering at the clinic. So it's been pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. This. Jess, are you there? Hi. Um, my name's Jesslyn. I'm also um, I'm in third year health sci, and I've been volunteering at the clinic for over two years. Awesome. Yes. It's fun. So. <laughs> but then, again, we are incredibly biased. <laughs> we really do have fun, though. Okay, so um, moving on, we just wanted to start off uh, today's webinar just by talking about the different causes of shortness of breath, because it's not just purely COPD. Obviously, there are a lot of different causes. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the first of which would be heart failure, which Dr. Kearney were here to, to emphasize this. Um, but the reason you may be short of breath uh, if you're experiencing heart failure is because your heart is unable to pump blood as efficiently, and as a result, you have a lot of blood and uh, backing up into your lungs that causes fluid to kind of be pushed out uh, into your lungs, and that interferes with gas exchange, essentially. So you're not able to... Um, get oxygen into your blood and carbon dioxide out as easily, causing you to breathe more heavily. Uh, another significant cause of shortness of breath would be obesity or being overweight. So um, that's probably because having a larger body means that you have more oxygen needs, but it's also because fat also restricts your breathing. Uh, Karina has mentioned in the past that um, not only is it just affecting uh, your chest muscles, neck, that sort of thing, but it's also affecting your diaphragm. So you're not able to breathe as well because of that excess fat. Uh, thirdly, carbon monoxide. Um, we all have detectors in our houses, and the reason we have that is because carbon dioxide would preferentially enter your blood instead of oxygen, so it kind of steals the spot of oxygen, and so you're breathing more heavily in hopes of getting oxygen to enter your body, uh, which is incredibly deadly. Okay, and then fourth reason, anxiety. When you're anxious, you tend to breathe more shallowly because you're, you're panicked, or you may be hyperventilating. Either way, not great techniques to help you receive oxygen. Uh, next slide. Okay. All right. Anemia is also a significant cause of shortness of breath. Um, that's not because it's, there's inefficient gas exchange per se. It's because your red blood cells, which are the little transporters that carry oxygen throughout your body, we don't have enough of them. And maybe because you're iron deficient or maybe another, another reason. Um, but as a result, you're not able to meet your body's oxygen demands. Another potential cause is pulmonary fibrosis, which is different from COPD because it's, um, it's actual lung tissue damage and scarring. Um, it tends to be a bit more uh, ambiguous in terms of the cause occasionally. It's usually um, because smoking is a risk factor for sure, leading to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but other times it's because of exposure to chemicals such as asbestos, uh, coal dust, that sort of thing, and also autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, or even chemotherapy and other medications can lead to scarring of your lungs, resulting in difficulty breathing. Uh, lastly, Asthma and COPD. Asthma results in inflammation and narrowing of the airway, so it's hard to get enough oxygen to your lungs. And as for COPD, we will be touching upon that incredibly shortly, so stay tuned. <laughs> We're approaching. Okay, next. Okay, just want to quickly touch upon weight. As you all know, Dr. Kernu always emphasizes how losing weight is one of the best ways to keep yourself healthy. And that's because having a healthy weight allows you to reduce the risk of developing or potentially worsening if you already have a condition such as cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, COPD, cancer, the list goes on. Being of a healthy weight can be incredibly handy uh, for your health. Um, some more recent research has shown that overeating as well and being overweight can potentially trigger some immune responses and that leads to excessive inflammation, which is not a good thing to have in your body. It messes up a lot of systems. <laughs> Gonna leave it there, but um, I just want to touch upon that. Also something to emphasize, if your BMI is currently over 30, um, definitely losing weight will be the first step to helping you feel better. In order to lose that weight, you could potentially do something small, such as just taking a five-minute walk three times a day, something small like that, doing a bit of yoga, um, banding together with other people to lose weight so that there's that community aspect. 
So there are a lot of avenues to try out, but if you believe that you are overweight or obese, um, then remember that there's a lot of support out there, and uh, this is one of the first steps you can take to helping yourself feel better and, and live a more enjoyable life. Okay, next. Uh, next slide. Alrighty, and if you're not sure where to start exactly, because um, there are a lot of different ways that you can potentially lose weight, a great resource would be <laughs> our YouTube channel, actually, which hopefully you're currently on or at least familiar with. So we have a lot of fantastic videos on there involving diet, exercise, or just more education about other healthcare conditions that you may have. Um, so a lot of resources on there uh, if you're interested in learning a bit more about how you can stay healthy. And now we can move on to talking a little bit about COPD. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Just going to pass it on to Jess. Hi. Um, so some of you may have COPD or have heard about it, but basically it's a chronic um, obstructive pulmonary disease. So it's where your air flows um, are uh, obstructed, so it's harder to breathe. Um, there are main two types of COPD, so we have emphysema and bronchitis. And emphysema is where um, you have a, a damage in your alveoli, um, which is where gas exchange happens. Um, so they're very, very small sacs uh, that are very fragile. They're like one cell thick, so it's really easy to damage them either through um, smoking, um, Chronic, chronically smoking or uh, through particulate matter that you breathe in or any other damaging fumes. Um, and w when you cause too much damage, um, you lose like the integrity of the elastic fibers inside. Um, so when you breathe, the, um, these sacs can easily collapse or um, causing an obstructed, obstructed breathing. So um, that's emphysema. And then we have bronchitis, which is the inflammation of the bronchial tubes. So when these are inflamed, um, it gets irritated and our body responds by creating more mucus um, and that can cause further obstruction. So these are the two um, kind of diseases that fall under COPD and um, although this is usually, um, in, there's no cure for COPD, um, you can slow progression um, and live a relatively healthy life life by changing up your lifestyle, making sure that you stop um, your unhealthy habits that cause COPD, so like breathing in fumes or smoking and that sort of thing. And usually people who manage their COPD well lead, go on to lead like really healthy and long lives. So yeah, next slide. Um, so we wanted to touch a bit about the uh, breathing and how the diaphragm plays into it because um, later on we'll talk about some breathing techniques that would that will need you to understand what the diaphragm is. So it's a big muscle um, attached right under your lungs um, and it helps you breathe. So it's the main muscle used for breathing and so it's a dome shaped muscle that when you inhale it um, contracts and flattens making your um, kind of uh, chest cavity bigger and drawing in, in air into your lungs and then um, when you exhale it returns to its shape and it forces the air back out. So it's a very important and strong muscle that we use for breathing and obviously there's other muscles that you use to help facilitate breathing especially when you're exerting yourself like muscles around your neck, your back and your abdomen but these are not as strong in helping um, breathing so you patients with COPD often have weakened diaphragms and they use these muscles to compensate for it, but it's not as um, strong, so you, it can lead to fatigue and shortness of breath. Um, yeah, but there are definitely exercises to help you strengthen the diaphragm. Next slide. So um, when you have COPD, there's something called flare-ups where your symptoms can get significantly worse. Um, for a period of time, um, so they're exacerbated, and these are important to look out for um, because they can lead to some pretty serious episodes. Um, so you have to pay attention to your breathing pattern and the consistency of your coughs. So um, only you know best about how you breathe regularly. 
So um, if you have, if you notice increased shortness of breath or noisy or breathing, either you're wheezing or you hear some gurgling sounds, um, those are all signs that um, so the symptoms are getting worse. Um, and if you have irregular breathing, so if, um, you feel like you're breathing really fast or really slow um, or not, um, or like alternating between these rhythms or it requires more effort to breathe, these are also signs. Um, that your symptoms are worsening and also coughing when you cough more often um, if you're experiencing a fever or um, you, you have like increased swelling in the ankles although these are all um, symptoms that could happen for other things if you find that they're compounding and you feel like um, something isn't right it could likely be a COPD flare-up next slide so, um, although, as I mentioned, um, COPD uh, is a progressive um, disease, it is very easy, uh, manageable um, by changing like habits or your environment, um, kind of being more wary of uh, the things around you can help you uh, live a really productive and comfortable life. Um, so, there are factors that uh, you should be aware of, um, for example, stress, um, poor air quality, smoking, flu and uh, cold, um, inadequate sleep, and an active lifestyle. So we'll uh, first start off with stress. So there's been a lot of evidence um, in the next slide. There's been a lot of evidence that um, long-term exposure to stress hormones can decrease the effectiveness of your immune system. So that makes it easier to get um, like a respiratory infection or um, the flu, the cold. So uh, managing your stress is important to leave a healthy lifestyle. And a study found that um, life event stress affected uh, patients who uh, had COPD more when compared to um, non-COPD individuals. So it's especially um, important to monitor your stress levels um, if you have COPD. And there's um, simple ways um, that you, or things that you can do um, every day that can help you decrease your stress levels a bit. Um, so you can listen to calming music, music you enjoy, uh, watch funny movies, and I know like a lot of things are going on in the news these days, but it's um, quite important to focus on yourself um, and how you're feeling. So if you feel like this, the, the news um, currently is stressing you out, it's important to turn it off for a bit and just focus on yourself. Um, you can meditate or do yoga, and we also have quite a few mindfulness workshops or videos on our YouTube channel that can give you more information on that. Um, and then you can also go out for a walk. Um, that's often really calming, and it's also good um, to exercise a bit, and that will also help um, with your uh, symptoms when you're exercising your body. Um, next slide. And also, air quality is really important um, to uh, avoid exacerbating your symptoms. So you have to be um, aware of the indoor and outdoor air quality. So um, indoors, uh, you should do things such as remove clutter because that's where dust likes to collect. Um, you should clean up the dust mites um, and inspect air conditioners for mold and mildew. So change out filters um, if you find that it's getting... Um, Dirty, and then also um, you could use air filters. Um, and there, I know there are like small um, portable machines that is being sold at like Canadian Tire or Amazon. Um, they're an investment, but um, they help clean out your indoor air if the quality isn't as good. And the HEPA filters are like the gold standard for those. Um, and then you should avoid fumes from cleaning products, perfumes, paints, um, hairsprays, things like that could irritate your lungs. Um, you should definitely, um, this is very important, uh, stay away from smoking because that is the number one way uh, in which you can worsen COPD and quitting is the best way to help improve your condition. And then um, you should stay away from pet hair if possible. Um, and you should also go out, um, go avoid going outside on bad days um, or like days with poor air quality. So next slide. So Canada actually has a website um, where their citizens can check 
the air quality outside. Um, and we have we go by something called the air quality health index. So it goes from one to ten, and then anything it's advised that um, for uh, vulnerable populations, anything moderate and above uh, should be avoided, or you should become more um, careful. Um, so you should avoid doing outdoor activities or spending a long time outside when um, the quality is four or above. Um, and you can go to the website um, that from the government of Canada to check. Um, they do um, next slide. They estimate like two days in advance um, what the air quality is going to be like. And then the Hamilton one, they have three um, three regions that they give uh, forecasts on, and you can um, kind of uh, gauge whether you want to plan your outdoor activities on these days. Um, with the air quality they predict. Yeah. So next slide. Uh, and now Winnie will talk to you more about smoking since cessation. Yeah. Awesome. So as Jesslyn already said, smoking is the number one leading cause of COPD and various other lung diseases. So we just want to quickly emphasize how important it is that if you're not smoking to never take up smoking. And also if you're currently smoking, please do look into quitting. Um, about 85 to 90 percent of COPD cases are caused by smoking and that's because there are over 7,000 chemicals that are released and being breathed in by you uh, when you're smoking a cigarette. So that results in a greater risk of not only lung disease but also cancer, heart disease, stroke, uh, diabetes and, and a number of other conditions as well. Uh, next slide. So if you are able to quit. Even if you relapse eventually, quitting has an immediate effect on your health. So this is just a quick timeline. I'm going to breeze over it really quickly. But as you can see, from starting from 20 minutes when your heart rate starts decreasing, your blood pressure starts decreasing, great cardiovascular improvements, uh, over to one to nine months where you stop coughing as much and your lung function increases, um, over to the point of one year where you have half the risk of smoking-related heart disease or stroke, 10 years, your risk of dying from lung cancer, various other cancers decreases a lot, and then 15 years as well, where incredibly um, you have the health of almost someone who has never smoked before. So the risk of coronary heart disease has significantly decreased. So even if you're, say, 60 now, if you're 80, you still got a while to go. You can have a lot of improvements in your health if you quit smoking now. So we just want to touch upon how, how integral it is to invest in your health in this way um, and to also touch upon some ways in which you can quit smoking on the next slide. Uh, next slide. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is taken from um, our other presentation, more on that later. Uh, this is just a very basic quit plan. If you are considering quitting, then feel free to take a picture or a screenshot right now. Uh, but just to run over it really quickly, some steps to ensure that you successfully quit um, are to write down a couple of steps or rather some motivations for quitting. Because when later on when you're experiencing those cravings and such, it's handy to look back and remember exactly why you're doing all this, who you're doing it for, those things. Uh, also keep in mind whether or not you want to quit abruptly, so cold turkey, or quit gradually. There are pros and cons to both methods both methods, and I'll leave it to the audience to do some more research um, or to check out our other webinar on uh, pros and cons of those both. Uh, but super important step is to set a quit date. Um, it's important to hold yourself accountable. A lot of individuals say, oh, I'll just do it like after the holidays or I'm not really feeling it this year, I'll wait till New Year or something like that. Um, but it's important to pick a date, write in your calendar, let the people around you know that you're going to be quitting by that date, so you have a tight deadline that you know that you must meet. Okay? Uh, also, nicotine replacement products, um, or NRT, um, and also medications such as Zyban or Champix are options, so you can discuss them um, with your healthcare provider. Uh, and also join free programs that um, provide free nicotine replacement therapy, so they send you patches and such for a month or two, so that can help you reduce, um, reduce cravings and other symptoms. Also, 
keep a note of what your triggers are. A lot of individuals have tried to quit in the past and then relapse later on. And just want to again emphasize that relapse does not mean failure, okay? A lot of you guys are really hard on yourselves when it comes to relapsing. But it's, it's normal and it's part of the journey and there have been individuals who have relapsed over 15 times before they get there and successfully quit. So please, please, please do not give up on yourself and remember to learn from these experiences by noting down what triggers got you in the end and figure out ways to plan to avoid them this time around. Sometimes it helps to keep a notebook or an app or something to keep track of what you're doing. Um, uh, but above all, uh, also remember to clean away anything that could potentially trigger you so that ties in with the planning phase So that includes putting away lighters, ashtrays, throwing away cigarettes If you live with someone who is also smoking, try to convince them to to avoid the habit around you or potentially become your quit buddy So the two of you can quit together um, And uh, lastly, remember that it's an achievement if you do quit, okay? And chances are you probably will It's an achievement, therefore think about ways that you're going to reward yourself it's kind of hard to reward yourself during a pandemic, but consider getting some fancy takeout, renting a nice movie, go visiting the grandkids, something of the sort to keep you motivated and, and remind yourself that it's a huge accomplishment to successfully quit smoking. Okay, uh, so next slide. Okay, so I breezed over that really, really quick. But if you are interested in learning more about how to quit smoking and also uh, the benefits of quitting smoking, things like that, feel free to check out our other video, um, Smoking Cessation, Why and How to Quit. It's on our YouTube channel, and just keep an eye out for that thumbnail because it'll be floating down there. Next slide. And now I'll pass it back to Jess, who's going to talk to us a bit about uh, getting vaccines and uh, the importance of sleep and exercise. Yeah, so um, more things to avoid um, making your symptoms worse would be to get a flu shot and make sure you're updated on your vaccines. So right now we're in flu season, so you should go out and get the flu shot because um, it's been shown that the, the rates of morbid morbidity and uh, mortality are higher um, for patients with COPD who contract influenza. So um, it's important to try and avoid um, getting the flu. Um, you should also try avoiding crowds, which is pretty much mandatory right now because of COVID, so that should be easy to do. Um, and uh, you should stay up, make sure you're up to date with your other vaccines as well. So we have the uh, pneumococcal vaccine, which is to kind of protect you from pneumonia. Um, and pe people with COPD also are more likely to contract pneumonia and um, suffer from um, it more than people without COPD, so it's important to avoid that. Um, and then the pertussis vaccine, which is for whooping cough, is also something you should be up to date with. And um, Kearney also mentioned to stay up to date with your shingles vaccine, um, as that could put unnecessary stress on you. Yeah, so remember to get your flu shot, very important. And uh, yeah, I also wanted to mention that it's kind of hard these days to try and get a flu shot. Sometimes they're uh, in high demand. Um, but I do know that there are some shoppers that are doing more of a come first come first serve system. So I would recommend calling your local shoppers and asking them if they anticipate a new shipment. Sometimes they'll just ask you to call back each day or other ones will ask you to book an appointment. So just call in your local area. They're doing them a little bit different these days, but because they're in high demand, it's good to uh, try a number of different shoppers in your area to see if you can get a flu shot as soon as you can. I just wanted to uh, chime in there because I had a little bit of information on that. Yeah, that's definitely good to know. Very practical stuff. Um, okay, so next, uh, you should focus on your sleep and exercise. So a lack of sleep would make uh, will decrease the effectiveness of your immune system. So it's incre uh, important to get um, a good night's sleep. And what's been found to be good um, for sleeping is exercise. So um, just going out and walking or doing some mild exercise can help you have a better sleep at night. Um, and it is also the second most powerful way to manage your COPD after smoking cessation. So that is 
um, something important that you should look into, and Ted will go in more depth for, uh, about exercise later on. Um, yeah, so what I found was that low-impact aer aerobic exercises are um, good for COPD patients. Yep, so next. <laughs> yeah, so food for thought. Are you sleeping more than Dr. Kernew? Um, <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I don't know that's a discussion question because I thought Dr. Kernew would be here. And uh, <laughs> we could tease him a little bit about how much he's sleeping. I don't know if anyone wants to guess how much he's currently sleeping. Any takers? Not enough. <laughs> Pretty much. I think he said he's sleeping about five hours these days. So mm -hmm. um, at the very least, you have to be Dr. Kearney when it comes to sleep, okay? So <laughs> try to get the full eight hours, please. Take care of yourselves. Okay, next slide. Alrighty, and we just wanted to end off this session uh, with a reminder to stay informed and monitor your health. This isn't just regarding COPD, by the way, like everything that Jocelyn said relates to a lot of health conditions beyond COPD. Um, and so please remember to do integral little things such as just getting your blood work done on time, making sure that your vaccinations are up to date and getting your flu shot this year, particularly with COVID around as well. Um, and also updating your medications list and keeping it on you, as we tell you every time <laughs> all of you come into the clinic, it is really important. Um, and just remember that um, even if you're not short of breath now, please don't wait until you become short of breath to take action. Preventative care is so much more powerful than um, treating yourself once you start experiencing symptoms. So try to keep that in mind. Uh, next slide. Okay, so just a quick reflection point um, for those of you who are joining us on YouTube, feel free to pause the video right now and just reflect on this question. So what health factors do you feel that you can improve on? You can take a moment to pause, develop a specific goal, such as using the SMART format uh, on what you want to tackle for the next 30 days and write out a comprehensive plan of how you're going to do that. Okay, feel free to let us know at your next appointment, what your plan is, and we'll be happy to hold you accountable for it. Um, but please just remember try to take action, okay? Okay, next slide. And if you're not sure where you should start uh, with when it comes to improving on your health or what factor you need to tackle, again, uh, <laughs> really pointing it out <laughs> and stressing it too much, but we do have a lot of resources on our YouTube channel. If you think that it will help you, feel free to just take a glance through them. Check out the, the, um, the timestamps that, that Stuart added. See if there's anything that piques your interest and that you think will be of help to yourself. Uh, next slide. Alrighty, and now it is time to welcome today's fantastic guest speaker, Corinne, and I'm just gonna let you take the floor from here on out. Uh, thank you, Winnie. That was great. Just uh, Jess was great. You guys are doing a great job. I don't know how you need me. <laughs> um, I, I'm the respiratory therapist that Dr. Kernew is stuck with, it seems, and and uh, m the most important thing to realize um, for Dr. Kernew is how to do an assessment. Before you can be told that you have COPD, um, many doctors will suspect it, and healthcare professionals, but the, there's an assessment, and, and I'm going to go through breathing techniques, too. So when you come to see me, spirometry is the most um, accurate tool to assess for COPD and asthma. Unfortunately, uh, with COVID-19 uh, at the moment, uh, um, my college and, and uh, doctors um, in the uh, pulmonary function labs were not allowed to do uh, spirometry because you're exhaling vapors and only allowed if you're doing it in a negative pressure room and uh, oh, and you have a HEPA filter. So until that, until we're cured from this, uh, this COVID, we won't be doing uh, spirometry, but we will be doing assessments. Um, so, thank you. This is the assessment sheet. Um, I don't have another copy of the slide, so I'm just, uh, I'll, when I think we're done, I'll just say, next slide, please. Um, 
Okay, so uh, what I've been doing now is a general assessment. There's also a Canadian, it's, it's called the Canadian Lung te Test, uh, Canadian Lung Health Test. And you'll see the little um, tear-off sheets, likely in your doctor's office, but unfortunately, no loose papers are allowed to be around at the moment. But there are three or four major questions, and they're asking, and if you, can t if you tick any one of them, you may have a lung, uh, um, uh, a lung disease. Do you cough? frequently do you have shortness of breath do you cough up sputum do you are you able to exercise without being short of breath now if you answer yes to to any one of those questions um, it's time to get tested or to have an assessment by your doctor uh, always allow okay so what I do when you come into my office or, or um, when I speak to you on the phone, I do a smoking status. And uh, the smoking status is, is not to make anybody feel guilty for smoking because um, back in, in the days, many of us started smoking and it took a really strong person to stop smoking. So what we look for is is whether or not you've smoked in the past, are you currently smoking, and then we assess how many years you've, you've smoked for. This helps us to determine where your lung condition, uh, how your lung condition is at the moment. So some people who are currently smoking, I always ask, are, are you interested in quitting smoking? And if you are, then I send you off to Winnie, who uh, every Tuesday and Thursday after 4 o'clock, uh, she does. She does her own assessment for smoking cessation. It, it's wonderful how the city, how all of Ontario, really, public health is provide is providing nicotine replacement therapy and some counseling. So take advantage of the free things that are going on. Um, I'm not going to go too much with uh, smoking, but I want to ask the next question: Is have you been diagnosed with um, COPD, which is chronic. COPD stands for chronic obstructive, which is like a kink in the tube, pulmonary Latin for lungs disease. And it's an umbrella of asthma, chronic bronchitis, um, emphysema, and then some other lung issues, uh, genetic diseases. If you've been diagnosed, we want to know what your spirometry results were. And that helps us to put you in a classification, whether you're a recent COPD person with mild COPD or all the way up to very severe. The Canadian lung test, I think, next slide, please. Oh, uh, um, I'm not going to step on Winnie's toes. That's all your stuff. The smoking cessation part, Winnie. Oh, <laughs> no, it's fine. You can feel free to elaborate. I think you would do a way better job than me anyway. <laughs> yeah. it, it's very basic. But then, then we want to know what, what um, current inhaler therapy are you, are you taking? Some people are taking any therapy. Some people are taking um, just the blue puffer, which is the salbutamol. And some are taking, um, well, you can see the whole list here. A Lama Laba, ICS, Lama Laba, uh, combined, uh, Laba ICS, Laba Lama ICS. It sounds like a dance. <laughs> these are dance steps. But each, each medication has a different function. So then, then I, then I, I'd like to know, have you had an exacerbation <clears throat> in the last year? And an exacerbation is a lung flare-up. <clears throat> it could be, uh, oh no, I haven't had a lung exacerbation, but I've had some bronchitis. Well, bronchitis is an irritation of the airways, and, and it's to be, what we're concerned about is how many um, flare-ups and how many bronchitis have you had in the past year? Some people have 
one mild one or they have a head cold that oh oh I just got a head cold but I always seem it always seems to go down to my lungs that's that's what we considered we consider a flare-up so be aware of, of what that flare-up can be some people require hospitalization and if you've had two or more uh, people who have what we used to call in the old days, and that's in the 70s, we used to say this person has chronic bronchitis. Well, that's two flare-ups a year. Most times, uh, people who have lung disease will get a flare-up in November, December, in that flu season time, and then possibly in February uh, to March and April. So those are significant flare-ups, and every time you get a flare-up, you damage part of your little alveoli, which is like a little tiny rubber band. And if that, be you know what a rubber band is like, if it becomes um, overstretched, it doesn't go back to its original shape. So that's why we quiz people about their exacerbation history. And we want to be sure that you understand what a flare-up is. The most important thing that I do in my when I talk to people um, is determine their inhalation technique. So each there are so many different inhalation um, therapies on the market. I can't see this. Let me see if I can put this. If I can put my video on. Look how many we have, and they all. Some of them are just one molecule different, and some uh, some are easier to take, some are more difficult to take, but we have a whole bunch of inhalers. So my job is to... I'm is to Whoops. I'm not sure if Am your uh, video is on. There we go. Now oh. we can see you. Oh, I'm sorry. Perfect. Right. Okay. These are all... <laughs> Here we go again. Here's a whole smattering of our puffers available in Canada. I, I'm just going to put it away now because I don't need to confuse anyone. And I'm sure everybody on this YouTube um, call today has been on one or two different types of inhalation therapy. It, it doesn't matter which one you're on, in, in my opinion. What matters is are you taking it correctly? And if you're not taking it correctly, there's no point in being on any medication. So I would, my job is um, is to be sure that you're taking it properly. And when I say show me, um, I expect you to be doing it safely. If if I can't see you, I ask you to describe it to me right from the time you pull it out of your medical. Uh, kit or your purse or your back pocket. I, I want you to use your words to describe it, what you're doing. Okay, so some people do have difficulty taking their device and that's where a respiratory therapist comes in handy because what we do is set up the device for the patient's ability to take it. Next slide, please. Is there a question? I or no do i see a question uh i think we're good i don't see any questions in the chat but do, do we monitor um youtube for yeah. comments yeah no no questions yet green you're doing oh. good no okay. questions <laughs> thank you sorry to interrupt no sorry what are the symptoms of a flare-up a lot of many people don't recognize what a symptom is now, we've heard a lot about COVID and runny nose and pink eye and runny eye and everything else, but the most common thing in our, in our lives is having uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And what are those symptoms? So that's what I help people to recognize. I still, again, determine what, um, how often you have a flare-up. But to describe a common symptom when you have a flare-up, do you have any of the following? Is there a change in your phlegm, your mucus? 
a change in color, a change in the amount, a change in the thickness, thinness of it. Is, is there a change in your activity level? Are you the, the type of person who goes out and vacuums their uh, living room and dining room and, and then suddenly you, have, you can't do both rooms at once, you have to stop in the middle and take a rest? That's a change in your activity level. If you could play golf, you could play nine holes, but you're very tired after the third or fourth hole, that's the change in your activity level. So be aware what those changes are and what, how relative it is to you. It, do you have any unusual increase in shortness of breath? Now some people, like I have heard, I wish I had a dime for every time somebody said it, um, would say to me, oh yes, I find that now that I'm getting older, I'm slowing down. Well, that doesn't, getting older doesn't mean that you're going to have more shortness of breath. Getting older means you're going to get wrinkles. So don't, uh, don't think that getting, uh, having more shortness of breath just means, oh, I'm over 60 now and I'm getting slower. Shortness of breath is the number one sign that we can identify ourselves and you saw at the very beginning uh, when Jess did her presentation it, it could be lung disease it could be heart disease and if any of those two diseases aren't examined then it snowballs to something bigger um, the, uh, for those of uh, my COPD patients who are on medication, if suddenly they're taking more rescue medication, and that's the blue puffer, which is the salbutamol. If you're taking more salbutamol, um, it's telling you that you're not being managed or you're more short of breath. And once you're more short of breath, you're in trouble. So these are, these are things to look for. Uh, the other things are an increase in cough, um, increase in mucus, is it thick, is it thin, what color is it? People who have a lot of mucus, uh, most times it's very thin and watery, could be white or clear. And the change for them, for somebody who's getting a flare-up, would be there's more mucus, it's thicker, and it's changing color. It's going from more purulent color um, white to cl clear to white to yellow. That's a strong indication you're coming down with a flare-up. Is it thick or thin? Uh, these are all questions that the doctor would like to know because we need to understand are you, is, it, is a cold settling in your lungs? If it is, you're damaging those little air alveoli where the gas exchange takes place. The other thing to notice is if your uh, sleeping habits have changed. Do you wake up in the middle of the night coughing? Are you, um, are you taking, you wake up in the middle of the night and take your Ventolin puffer, your salbutamol, or do you use your CPAP machine? People, many people who use CPAP um, uh, may need CPAP if they're waking up frequently and not getting the rest they need. And the, uh, and everybody understands I'm feeling tired, more fatigued. That That's not just an age thing. That's, that's a system thing. Something's breaking down. You're setting yourself up for um, a lung infection. Now, the uh, Ministry of Health has a beautiful COPD action plan. And it's uh, not all doctors and pharmacists um, subscribe to it. But what many doctors will do is if you have uh, COPD, it's been diagnosed, and you're taking um, a puffer in the morning and, uh, or one a day, once a day puffer or twice a day puffer with your blue puffer to satisfy any shortness of breath, a, um, a doctor will give you a prescription for an antibiotic and a prednisone, which is the medication that stops inflammation. 
Now, <clears throat> and, the, and the prescription will sit at your pharmacy. And your pharmacist will honor it once you come in or call and say, I think I'm coming down with a lung infection. And you all know when that is. I've given you all the symptoms from before. And this, this uh, slide project, uh, this slide shows you everything to, that will support any symptoms that might be causing you to come down with a lung infection. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the, uh, if we could just go back for a second, I'm sorry, Stuart. Um, the, the one reason why I, I like patients to have <clears throat> a COPD action plan is so that they can start their medication immediately and not wait until Monday morning when Dr. Kernu returns to the office or, or is in the office but not seeing patients or your family doctor is on vacation or your family doctor can't see you. Uh, right at, until Wednesday. This, this action plan allows you, the patient, to understand your own symptoms and then decide on your own because everybody, you know your own body, go, go to the pharmacy and get the medications that you require. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the steroid is a, an those of you who have been on steroids know, know how unpleasant they can be. So you don't want to go on these medications unless you're pretty certain that you've met all the qualifications for the patterns of uh, symptoms to, to take the antibiotic and the steroid. Next plan, uh, pl uh, pl slide please. This COPD assessment test, it's short form for CAT score, determines how, how bad your symptoms are. And it goes from a zero to five, zero being um, the weakest or the strongest and five being the worst. And all these questions will ask, we ask you, do you, are you coughing zero to five? Um, do you have phlegm? Now, the most important one here is, does your chest feel tight? Some people don't realize that tightness in your chest, it's not, it's similar to an elephant sitting on it. It's not cardiac, it's not a heart attack uh, tightness, but it just feels that you can't get the deep breath that you need. Some women, ladies who have, um, wear a bra, they'll say, oh, it feels like my bra is too tight. That's what tightness in the chest can mean. When, uh, and I'm not going to talk about cardiac because that's Dr. Kernu's uh, area. But just be aware that that tightness in your chest that you can't get the breath in or you feel short of breath indicates that you need your rescue medication. Um, energy is the mo another one. And you can see a decline. And as we age, we, we uh, I mean, I don't run marathons anymore. But I'm still running. So uh, I, I, don't, don't think just because you're older, you, you don't have the energy to do things. You watch the decline on your own. But a, a peak, like a big drop in your energy level is significant to be aware of. Next slide, please. Now, another way that we, and here we go, we've got um, people who have breathing problems don't always feel confident leaving the house. Uh, they need something to, to lean on to help them walk. And, and it's another, uh, and we want you to get up and go, uh, uh, not, uh, not to insignificant places these days because of COVID, but we want you to go out for a little walk every day. If you don't feel confident leaving your home without your, um, and you should have your puffer all the time, but if you don't feel confident because of your breathing, that's, that's significant to us. Next slide, please. Now, one of the final things that we look for, it's called the Medical Research Counselor 
Council on uh, Dyspnea Score. All that means is shortness of breath. And we have a scale t to monitor that. Some people only get short of breath when they're exercising. So exercising is like um, shoveling heavy snow. That's exercise. The other, and it goes, that's a zero. I only get breathless with strenuous exercise. I get short of breath when hurrying on the level or walking up a slight incline. I get, I walk slower than people my, uh, the same age. Or I get breath, I have to stop for a breath when walking at my own pace. And, and as it progresses, I stop for a breath after walking about 100 meters or after a few minutes on the level. 100 meters is a football field, like the, uh, um, a good block. And number four is I'm too breathless to leave the house or I'm breathless when dressing or undressing. My key question for people is, um, can you wash your hair in the shower or in the tub? By lifting up your arms and washing your hair and rinsing it well, that's a good indicator of your, of your shortness of breath scale. So it, it's very important what everyone else has said. I'm just going to wrap up here. Um, based on these scores, your doctor will determine what medication you can try. And as I said, we always like to give, the, uh, to give our patients the medication that they can handle, that their technique is doing well. Okay, and I think that's about it. I mean, uh, I can go into the gold um, guidelines and classifications, but that's more uh, medical side. And and I would I'd be happy to continue on with that if you'd like me to explain it. it Winnie, it's up to uh, you. <laughs> just wondering if you think it'll significantly help patients. Uh, if you think um, if no. you think it won't contribute too much, then we can move on to some breathing exercises where we have you uh, full screen demoing to everyone uh, some awesome techniques. Let's do that. Okay, so breathing techniques. Well, I think we should give um, Stuart. Is there some way to get Corinne on the screen? Yes. Uh, yes, working on that now. So should be able to see you. And you can, by all means, go ahead. Okay. When you're short of breath and you're walking, for example, walking up a flight of stairs, the first two stairs you're able to manage it. <gasps> <sighs> then you come to the third stair, <sighs> and you, you, your breathing picks up. You become more short of breath. What we need to do is slow that breath down because all you're doing is breathing through a little tiny bit of your lungs. You're not breathing through your all your lungs. You're just breathing through a third of them. And what we need you to do is to breathe through your entire lung. So. And it's hard to do because I've learned I've learned how to do it when I run and or exercise. So you're taking your breath and walking. <sighs> <sighs> Exhale. Extend extend your exhalation so that you squeeze all the air out of your lungs. So that the next breath that you take in, everything comes down and fills your lungs. <sighs> 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 And before you know it, you you regained your composure, your breathing. You also know that you can't run up a flight of stairs anymore. And that's not just age, that's lung power. So take everything slowly, slow your breath down, and work on it that way. There, there's another way I tell my uh, patients um, in pulmonary rehab, we we talk about pursed lip breathing. And pursed lip breathing is, is slowing your breath down so that your inhalation, you fill your lung, and your exhalation, you purse your lips like you're going to kiss your, your puppy or your kitty, and you're going to... 
by doing a pursed lip breathing, walking up the stairs or walking up a slight incline, it forces you to exhale and squeeze out the air of your lungs so that the next breath that comes in, it pulls the air all the way down to the bottom. That's what, that's what we call pursed lip breathing. Once you master that, and it, it's a very natural way to breathe when, you, when you're short of breath. If you're exercising, you're shoveling snow or raking leaves, you, you automatically breathe out. But by pursing your lips, you create some positive pressure around your lips, to, around, in your lips that will keep the uh, bubbles, the alveoli in your lungs from collapsing. That it, get, it makes it harder for the air, or for the, um, it, it helps the air come out without making the lungs collapse. I, I know I've blown that. Um, maybe. <laughs> it's maybe, okay, don't sweat, don't sweat it, Corinne. <laughs> maybe you have a diagram. Now this is something called aerobica. Do you mind? Do you mind if I go on and talk about this? Uh, or go for it if you think it's a product that'll help patients. Yes, it, it, it's a tool that it, it's. Um, you can buy these either at a pharmacy or at a respiratory home care um, uh, establishment. It's a tool that does what pursed lip is doing. It create you dial in a, a certain number here and then you 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 exercise your lungs. If you don't exercise your lungs you lose the elasticity in them. And all this does you can see the mouthpiece is narrow and you exhale through it. Did you hear the fluttering? Some people may have had this um, type of device after they've had surgery to get their lungs moving again. Aerobica does, it mimics, and you can see that, it mimics pursed lip breathing. But nothing uh, works better than pursed lip breathing while you're walking up and down the stairs. So aerobica will help you to eliminate some of the phlegm and the sputum, the mucus that's in your lungs by creating that positive pressure against your exhalation. It just jiggles all that mucus and it'll help you to cough it out. I'm going to talk about huff coughing right now. Uh, hold on, Karen. I just wanted to ask, would yeah. you happen to know of any other devices other than um other than the one you just presented that may be feasible for patients to purchase? Yeah, you can, uh, there's another one, some people, uh, this is modern compared to what we had in the 70s. We had a tube, it looks like a toilet roll tube, with a, with a ball in it. And you, what we tried to get people to do is keep the ball suspended in, in the tube. Once you stop blowing, the ball drops. Um, it's, it's a positive pressure breathing device. Aerobica is the brand name, but it, but it works really well. Um, another way, I mean, the best way to do it is with your own lips. Purse your lips and... I don't like to say this, but it's a lot like... Um, blowing bubbles through a bubble um, machine. It, it's so important. Um, Jess said it, when stress is a big issue for shortness of breath. When we're stressed, watch somebody watching a movie that's um, suspenseful. You don't see their chest moving up and down. You don't, you don't see any movement. They're just breathing through the small portion of their lungs. That's why 
we try to encourage people to take that big breath in and then exhale against positive pressure because you're exercising your lungs and you're getting air from the top of your lungs all the way to the diaphragm where the muscle where the lungs sit basically sit on those are the, the best device those are all the devices that I can speak to um, they come under different trade names some people call them the ball exerciser um, but the aerobica they finally made a brand name for aerobica okay got it thank you <laughs> um, you you mentioned hot coughing mm -hmm. that's that's a very good um, method if a lot of people will say I've got so much phlegm and it's just here I just can't get it out the huff cough will help you to release that phlegm the best way to do it is to put a scarf or a towel or something around your waist right under above your waist right under your breast basically and you're going to hold it tight now now you can't take that big deep breath in so you're going to take as much of a breath as you can okay and now you're going to huff, huff it out and by holding the scarf you're restricting the amount of air coming back and you're kind of pushing whatever's left in your lungs to push it out so big breath in pull the pull the scarf tight and blow out huff and you might be able to release that phlegm that just seems to be sitting right here in your lungs people will say i know i i know i can get it out it's just there gravity helps if you put your head below your put, put uh, on your bed uh, put your head and chest below your hips and try coughing out <coughs> and the gravity will help to um, release it at least to get it out into your mouth um, but the huff method of coughing and I think uh, Winnie has the slide describing that um, it's a lot easier to demonstrate than to read it but now that you've seen how it's done when you read it you'll understand how to do it how to perform it and I think I think I've covered everything I've covered breathing techniques I've and I I'm not going to go through every um, every device because we could be here till tomorrow <laughs> But each device has its merits and its and its um, difficulties, the pros and cons. So that's up to a respiratory therapist to show you, or most likely the pharmacist. And remember, the pharmacist has a dispensing fee that he charges, or he or she charges. That dispensing fee is to demonstrate how to t have the proper technique to take your inhalation medication it all boils down to dollars and cents folks <laughs> any questions uh, no questions everything seems good um, anyone who's watching on YouTube as always we encourage you to ask any questions and we'll be sure to address them um, but in the meantime I suppose we can jump back onto the presentation and we'll go through a few more slides does that sound okay Sounds perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, Winnie, you let me know which slide you want me to jump to. Sure thing. Um, so originally there were a couple of slides about the different breathing techniques, but we're going to cover those pretty nicely. So we're just going to skip over them for the sake of time today. Um, so it should automatically skip. Okay. Yeah. So if you just press next, it should. Uh, there we go. So. 
Uh, hopefully everyone has had a chance to think about the different breathing exercises that Corinne mentioned and also to sort of do a bit of research yourself on what else is out there because um, there's also diaphragmatic breathing and, and deep breathing exercises and other things like that that may benefit some individuals out there. So feel free to explore. Uh, but anyway, just feel free to take a moment to reflect, think about what will work for you and consider developing a practice schedule because it's not just a matter of when you're short of breath, you do these exercises um, and then they'll help you magically recover from being short of breath. It's a matter of practice, taking time, maybe like um, just four to five times a day, five minutes each, to try out these exercises so you gradually strengthen um, your lung muscles. So not just your neck, chest, and, and back muscles, which often compensate for breathing, but also strengthening your diaphragm, which will make um, breathing a lot easier. I just want to briefly touch upon how there's this cycle when it comes to breathing. So a lot of the time is when we feel breathless, we tend to avoid activities that cause us to feel breathless. And as a result, you start doing less. And then that causes your muscles to weaken, which then feeds back and actually causes you to get even more breathless. Um, and then you just feel depressed. <laughs> and you start avoiding activities that make you feel breathless even more. So it's a downward spiral. Doing exercises, trying to stay active, even through just walking and other um, less uh, like exertional activities, doing some of those um, and developing a habit, those will go a long way for you to break that cycle and ensure that your, your lung health um, and muscle strength improves. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now we're going to pass it on to Ted, who's going to talk to us uh, a bit about lifestyle. Right, so um, next we'll be covering um, elements of lifestyle and specifically more on the diet and also uh, exercise side of things. So on this slide, uh, this is sort of just a very simple depiction of what occurs uh, when your lungs are affected with COPD. So when your lungs are affected with COPD, it's a lot harder to get air in and also for your lungs to work. And in, in the process of your lungs working harder, your heart also has to um, coincidentally also work harder in order to get the amount of air that you need uh, into your body. And these two things uh, all together can result in fatigue and also decrease in physical and mental health. So what are things that we can do to sort of help improve the situation for both our heart that has to work harder and also our lungs that also have to work harder? So on the next slide, um, so there, um, it's very commonly said that there um, are that exercise is a key component to sort of dealing with COPD, and I would like to just first clarify at the beginning that exercise is not it is not um, is not sort of a, a cure for COPD, nor is it something that will uh, sort of um, completely sort of cure you from um, COPD, but rather it's used as something to not only uh, as a prevention method, but also as a way of coping and having sort of a better life uh, when uh, being sort of living day to day with COPD. So some of the most common exercises that are recommended um, include walking or jogging, um, jumping rope, bicycle, uh, and also any sort of water related exercises such as swimming, and also sort of stress relieving and also um, sort of positional holding exercises such as yoga and tai chi. So the sort of similarity between all these exercises is that it it sort of elevates um, your breathing rate because you have to supply your body when you're exercising. And in doing so, um, it helps sort of you cope with uh, the normal sort of symptoms of COPD when you have flare-ups or have difficulties um, breathing. Uh, it sort of mimics that and makes it easier for you to cope. And also, at the same time, it does also sort of help you lose weight, which is uh, a benefit uh, in dealing with COPD. And also, it does help to sort of um, get you more physically in shape and more able to sort of deal with the stresses that are put onto your lungs and your heart. So in the next slide... Right, so uh, in this slide, basically just uh, a summary of what I just said. Uh, it helps decrease sort of your trouble in breathing. It helps you cope with the side effects of having COPD. And also, it sort of makes you more confident in dealing with such. And also, when you feel physically healthier, you're also sort of mentally healthier and also sort of more confident in your ability 
uh, to do day-to-day -day activities. So these are all benefits that come when you exercise. Uh, in the next slide. Right, so some of the activities that I listed before are just suggestions. Uh, and of course, these exercises and activities will vary based on sort of your lifestyle, uh, what you're doing, and also your sort of also your tendencies and the things that you like. So it's not by any means an exhaustive list or a list of things that you must do. So it's important to sort of take into account your lifestyle and seeing how you can implement exercise into your life. Uh, also, I want to stress that it doesn't have to be uh, a strenuous activity or something that puts a lot of stress uh, on you or also your body. Uh, just simple exercises daily or every two days or th uh, throughout the week is sufficient in order to improve your uh, symptoms with COPD and also your health. So moving on from exercises, uh, we're going to cover a little bit about diets and um, as a uh, I, as we stated previously, um, not only does your lung sort of work harder in order to get uh, the oxygen uh, into your body, which results in sort of your you're sort of uh, oftentimes having trouble breathing, but also it makes sort of your heart work harder. And there are a lot of things that um, we eat on a daily basis that can help or harm sort of our muscles and also our health. So. In an example diet, uh, yeah, you can see in the bottom picture, uh, a commonly sort of um, agreed upon fact is that a lot of parts of Western like diets that include sort of fast foods and high salt uh, foods is detrimental to sort of your quality of life and also uh, sometimes exacerbates COPD symptoms. So for an example, a more Mediterranean diet that has less salts and more sort of key ingredients that we will uh, cover in the next slide um, will sort of help you cope with COPD. So here is sort of we're just listing out the important uh, nutrients, uh, vitamins, and also components of your diets that are beneficial to uh, your health. The first is sort of um, having a low salt intake because salt can promote inflammation. Uh, the second sort of high, uh, having high fiber in your diet because that helps to strengthen your heart and also improve your quality of life. And sometimes um, if you're not careful, you can also be potassium deficient. So eating potassium rich foods is important in sort of supporting your lung function. And then it's also important to sort of eat less uh, unsaturated, yeah, eat less unsaturated fats and also uh, less sort of simple carbohydrates that are only sugars. So what's recommended is they eat complex carbohydrates that are often, um, uh, complex uh, carbohydrates that are often sort of high in fiber. So not only are you taking carbohydrates at a lower rate, but also you get that fiber um, as well. And also having high protein in your diet is also uh, beneficial because that helps to strengthen your muscles that work to uh, uh, in your lungs to uh, increase their ability to breathe. Uh, in the next slide. Right, so um, according to guidelines and especially important for uh, people who are dealing with COPD is having to serve the adequate amount of fruits and vegetables that contain a lot of the things that we uh, that was previously mentioned, such as fiber and vitamins and nutrients that you need in order to help uh, sort of increase your body's resistance uh, to uh, COPD. And so, for example, for fruits, it's recommended that you eat one to one point five cups per day, and for vegetables, you eat two point five to three cups per day. And all these, all these, uh, all this information can be found on the uh, government's website uh, of Canada. Um, and just some key things uh, to keep in mind that uh, are easy to sort of uh, incorporate into your diet include sort of complex carbohydrates that come in the form of sort of whole grain bread, uh, fresh fruits, vegetables, and also fiber and proteins uh, such as milk, eggs, uh, fruits and vegetables, again, that contain a lot of the fiber and nutrients that you need. And also an important thing to keep in mind is that when you um, sort of... Uh, 
tried to structure a diet, it's not going to be that easy to sort of switch your entire diet or uh, adhere to some rigorous uh, dietary plan. But it's important to sort of keep in mind to have sort to try and have a diet high in vegetables, fruits, and whole grain foods, and have a diet sort of low in salt, saturated fats, and simple carbohydrates. And one, one last thing about sort of trying to eat uh, fruits and vegetables that are high in the nutrients that you need that will help you uh, um, deal with the complications that arise from COPD. Uh, it's important to sort of look at vegetables and uh, fruits that are that have a dark, rich color, like dark greens, reds, or oranges, because that is usually sort of an indicator that that food has uh, it is high in the nutrients and fiber that you need. So taking that into account that there's a lot of things that go into your diet that can both harm and help you uh, deal with the, with complications and those sort of difficulties that arise from COPD, it's important to sort of take a look at your diet and see what, what aspects of your diet can you improve on and where in areas that you may be missing nutrients or different types of foods. Just going to sure. chime in here real quick. We do have a lot of other resources on our YouTube channel. If you're interested in checking out other videos on how you can uh, incorporate a lot of these healthy foods into your everyday diet, um, if you want to try out different types of diets or different types of food, then these are great resources. If, if you want to check them out, uh, feel free to do so. Next slide. And real quick, I'm just going to channel the spirit of Dr. Kernu because he said this quote <laughs> like a few days ago. So remember with regards to diet, exercise, medication, so many other things. Remember that doing nothing is not an option, okay? You have power over your health, and it's your responsibility to look after yourself. Of course, we have support all around you. Feel free to reach out to us if you need help. But remember that taking action and taking charge of your health is integral now. So please do yourself a service of doing so. Next. Okay, and then lastly, we're just going to touch upon uh, peppers and medication. Given the time, Ted, do you think we could we could speed it up a little bit? Yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary to actually cover the slides, including, like, for puffers and medications, because um, it was already covered sort of previously in the presentation and more in depth, I guess. We could just do a quick overview so everyone has an idea of how diverse the medications are, maybe? Right, so um, generally there's sort of three different forms that you can sort of administer the uh, medications in, and they sort of come in different types. The most common are sort of inhalers that you uh, take orally, um, and also I think there's tips later on in the presentation. Um, however, if you do find inhalers sort of hard to use, there's also the op uh, option of nebulizers, which would basically sort of turn the medication to sort of a mist, and then you sort of breathe that in. And there's also oral medications that um, lar I think largely come in, uh, that are largely sort of steroids and other things that help to reduce inflammation. And oftentimes, sort of um, medications and treatments that are offered uh, often contain sort of multiple different drugs and components uh, that, are, that is sort of known as combination of, um, medication. And I guess the most important thing is to find sort of the right uh, method of administrating uh, medication, also the right type of medication to use, and I think uh, it's important to sort of consult with a physician or a, a pharmacist or someone that's trained in the medical field to find you sort of the right uh, thing for you to use. Yeah, we, we can just go into the next slide. Yeah, and this is sort of um, the charts uh, that was held up previously, and these basically just cover the different types of drugs. And as you can see, there's long-acting, short-acting medications. There's combination uh, medications of varying sort of different types of drugs, and also different types of uh, different ways of sort of administering the drugs as well. Right, so you might recognize like some of the medications that you're currently taking on that chart, and just a reminder that if you feel that you know medications aren't working for you, if you're experiencing side effects, if you're curious about anything else, feel free to talk to your healthcare provider in order to just you know have, open up a dialogue to further discuss. 
Just quickly wanted to touch upon oxygen therapy. Not right for everyone, but it may be right for you if you find out that you have low levels of oxygen in your blood, and that is called hypoxemia. Hypoxemia. Gosh, there we go. Um, so you would have to confirm this by talking with your doctor who would measure your oxygen saturation levels to confirm that you actually have low levels of oxygen in your blood and they would provide a prescription. Um, but it can work very well for you. They have excellent portable types these days, so it's not like the bulky uh, tanks that you imagine from the movies or anything like that. Um, and if you use oxygen therapy, then it might, it might not completely solve, you know, your shortness of breath, but it'll hopefully reduce it. And then in turn, having more oxygen in your body will allow for reduced fatigue as well as better sleep. Um, there's continuous versus nocturnal exertional. So it's just a matter of are you taking the oxygen 24-7 or uh, only when you're, when you're sleeping or only when you're exercising. So um, that'll be a discussion for you to have with your healthcare provider about what may be right for you. And uh, um, just if, if you're smoking, though, it will be uh, difficult for you to take oxygen therapy because you're not allowed to smoke within three meters uh, of that oxygen tank for, for obvious reasons. All right, next slide. All right, and, and, and again, please feel free to pause the video, reflect on your current medications, and um, see if you feel like you need to talk to your doctor in order to adjust them. Next slide. Okay, and just want to close off today's awesome webinar by touching upon some other resources and supports that are out there. So next slide, uh, one of the big resources here in Hamilton particularly is the Caring for My COPD program held at Compass Community Health. They offer fantastic support for, for 10 weeks for free, so you can feel free to uh, reach out to them. We've attached, um, there's a referral form there, but if you just go onto the Compass Community Health website and go under, um, I believe it was, I'm on the website right now. If you go under Managing Your Health and Wellness, the tab under Programs and Services, there will be an entire blurb on this Care for My COPD program where you can access the poster and the referral form and send that over to your doctor if you think you'd benefit from this awesome program. I also want to highlight it is touch upon smoking cessation as well, so if you are a current smoker and plan on quitting smoking, this could be a great resource for you. Uh, next slide. Okay, and, and some other sports and resources. These are online resources. So there is the Canadian Lung Association. So they have a lot of lot on their website, but they also have a handy COPD handbook uh, that you can download from the resources section if you really want to dive in deep into the various causes, treatments, and other factors associated with COPD. Also, the Lung Health Foundation is a great resource uh, because they offer a lung health line that you can actually call or email to receive uh, very fast support. And they have a whole list of community support groups, um, and some of which are in Hamilton or at least nearby. So if you personally think that you benefit from having a community aspect to managing your COPD or any other lung disease, that sort of thing, then this is a great resource to check out and see if you can get in contact with some of these programs. Next slide. I think that's about it. So thank you everyone for joining us. Feel free to email us at the below email. I think the website is back up and running as well. Uh, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Stuart, any closing remarks? Well, I think that was fantastic. I think you covered pretty much anything I could have in terms of questions regarding shortness of breath, COPD, uh, and how to manage it. Um, it's funny because I was uh, having a, like a good hour yesterday where I was short of, short of breath and I and I couldn't figure out why. And I oh, still don't. Was. I know I still don't honestly know why, but I think it was just a little bit of stress and you know uh, I was probably feeling crammed in my room. I got a little bit of fresh air, fresh oxygen. I started uh -huh. feeling a little better. So I think there's a number of different obviously reasons why you may be short of breath, and I think you covered a lot of them. In fact, probably all of them. So. Um, I think it was very thorough. We don't have any outstanding questions in the chat, so I think everybody is processing all the information. Um, those who are joining us uh, live, you're more than welcome to come back to the video on our YouTube page. It's going to be posted right after we end this video, so you can go and rewatch any of the parts of the video. I'm also going to timestamp the video so that you can jump to the sections that are most important to you, um, so that you can find that information. Uh, really easily and quite accessibly. Uh, Winnie, do you have any maybe final closing remarks or takeaways that you just wanted to share to the patients? 
takeaways already. I think we already said it a lot throughout <laughs> this entire webinar, but just to emphasize again, remember to take action. Not sure if this webinar helped you. <laughs> Hopefully it did. And you noted down a few points that you think you'd be interested in trying out, but just remember to keep learning and really take charge of your health. Remember that there's always hope and that there's always something you can do to ensure that tomorrow you're, you're breathing better. You're just living life more so to the fullest. Uh, and just thank you everyone again for, for joining us and keep an eye out for additional uh, webinars covering other topics that may be leading to shortness of breath outside of COPD. Perfect. So thank you for joining us, everyone, and we hope to see you in uh, next week's Friday video. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.